Hello, everyone. I'm Lisa Carrico, Director of Family and Veteran Programs for the Missouri Humanities Council. We are a member-supported organization, and our mission is to enrich lives and strengthen communities by connecting Missourians with the people, places, and ideas that shape our society. Thank you for joining us for Chapter 9 of this 10-part virtual storytelling journey that brings the book Growing Up with the River, Nine Generations on the Missouri to Life. Growing Up with the River by Dan and Connie Burkhardt explores our state's rich cultural heritage through the eyes of nine generations of children growing up in river towns along the Missouri River. It is unbelievable that today we are presenting chapter nine and that we only have one more chapter to go. Today we'll explore Chesterfield in 2016. At this time, Chesterfield was grown to be the 14th largest city in Missouri and has expanded into the former floodplains of the Missouri River with the building of outlet malls and big box stores. A new bike lane across the just completed Missouri River Bridge now connects Chesterfield Valley to the Katy Trail Confluence Point State Park located in St. Charles County, less than an hour drive from Chesterfield. Today's chapter will be presented by poet, author, and educator, Sahara Sister Souls. She is a lover of light, life, and travel. She can be caught spinning in stories into poems, her one woman show and plays. Currently, she is a young adult service specialist at the St. Louis Public Library. She's a member and teaching artist of the Urban Arts Collective, where she facilitates workshops on performance and poetry. She co-coached the Youth St. Louis Poetry Slam team of 2019 as they took first place at Brave New Voices. And as the co-poetry director of the St. Louis Poetry Slam team, she coached the 2020 team as they kept their first place title. Well done. Uh, after Sahara's narration, we'll introduce our special guest. But first, we would like to thank Dan and Connie Burkhart for writing such a delightful book and for entrusting us to share these stories. And thanks to Brian Haynes for allowing us to share the beautiful illustrations. Please let us know that you're watching by asking questions and leaving comments. In partnership with the Higher Education Channel, HEC TV, the St. Louis Storytelling Festival, the Missouri History Museum, and Magnificent Missouri, we present Growing Up with the River. They were driving to see the confluence of the two biggest rivers in America, the entire family, except for Shep. Their border collie was good on car trips, but he'd want to race into the muddy river, and that would probably be a bad, messy, smelly idea. Her older brothers were into history and were excited to see where Lewis and Clark started and ended their voyage. Her youngest brother was reading a book but as they crossed the bridge, he said, look at all the snow on the water. She was the littlest, but she knew that it was in snow. She already had binoculars in her lap in her booster seat. Her dad had promised her that she would see them, huge white birds, almost the biggest in the whole world, with black tips on their wings blanketed the river. The American white pelicans were in Missouri on their way to Florida. This was the flyaway, the highway that birds took to their winter home. From the commotion, it looked like a restaurant too, since the birds were gulping down whole fish. Her mom said that on their trip south for the winter, ducks, geese, and pelicans stopped here at the confluence to rest and eat from the shallow water and fields nearby. They had been here before to see the bald eagles at the Audubon Center at Riverlands, but they had never driven a few miles farther to see where the rivers came together. They pulled into the parking lot at Confluence State Park and walked to the point. And it was a point where the rivers met. The boys could clearly see where the rivers collided with the Missouri coming in from the right and the Mississippi coming in from the left. How strong would you have to be to paddle a boat in those currents? Unbelievable, Dad said that one day they could find out how strong they would have to be by taking a canoe, a canoe trip from a few miles upriver around Pelican Island to the confluence. His friend, Big Muddy Mike, 
could take all of them in a huge wooden canoe that will carry 12 people from Pelican Island to the confluence in just a few hours. Until 2004, the only way to see Confluence Point was in a canoe or a boat or a helicopter. But the wife of Ted Jones, who started the Katy Trail, wanted to give everyone a chance to walk here, like they were right now. She gave the money to state parks to make it possible. While the Confluence itself was obvious, they didn't believe the sign. A tall post with a mark at the top that said, this very spot had been 20 feet underwater in 1993. Mom said, if all four of you kids stood on each other's shoulders, that would be just about 20 feet. Wow, how could that be? Dad said, this is why it's called a floodplain, because it floods. They decided to Google some images in, of the 1993 flood when they got home. Home was in Chesterfield, about an hour from the confluence. They had moved there before the brothers could remember, and they had always known Chesterfield Valley to be a place with lots of big stores, soccer fields, and places to eat. For some reason, Grandpa still called it Gumbo Bottoms, and he told them stories about the old smokehouse market before the malls were there. It was hard to believe that the highway on the way to the valley had also flooded in 1993 but they had seen pictures of the smokehouse under the water. Still, it wasn't easy to imagine that those flood photos in Chesterfield Valley was the same place. Grandpa tried to explain it. He said the Missouri River used to cover much more area and flooded the fields along its banks, but now it was trapped by levees on its sides. The brothers liked all of the stores in the valley and the bike trails along the top of the levee. They wondered why it mattered so much to some of the adults that the river didn't flood there anymore. It sounded like good news to them. One of Grandpa's friends knew a lot about the floodplain. He said that the floodplain provided an area for the river to spread out when it rains a lot, and it replenished the dirt in the fields of the river valley. The more stores and houses that were built in the floodplain, the less room there was for the river to spread out in the wet years. Levees will protect the stores, houses, and crops in one area, but it will make the flooding worse in others. The water has to go somewhere, his friend explained. Meanwhile, it seemed like people were always building something in the valley. There were cranes and new buildings, and now some brand new bridge crossed the Missouri River. On pretty days, their parents packed up their bicycles and they headed for the Katy Trail. The brothers could hop on the trail just a few minutes from the stores in the valley and ride far ahead of their parents, looking for turtles and birds and for sightings of the river. One day, on the drive home, they took the back roads and passed an enormous old building, the water plant. Their mom said that that was where the water came from when it wasn't in bottles. Mom said she once heard that enough Missouri River water flowed by Chesterfield in one day to give all of St. Louis enough water for a year? This is why little sister tried hard not to fall asleep in the car even when the sun was streaming in. There was so much to learn on those drives. The water we drink comes from that muddy river? Seemed like magic, just like the huge rock mountain they saw last week. It was on their favorite curvy road, Highway 94, and they begged to stop. They actually hiked to the top to see the view. It's a conservation area now, but it had once been a factory with a lot of dangerous and poisonous things. The only way to make sure people weren't hurt by what they had been there was to bury it under millions of tons of rock. They had always liked the song, called the Big Rock Candy Mountain. In the Big Rock Candy Mountain, there's a land that's fair and bright. And she wondered if it, this is what it looked like. This Big Rock Mountain covered up something pretty bad, but it was a cool place for a hike with a big view. The brother and sister knew that they were lucky to be in a family that liked to explore the Missouri countryside, looking for bald eagles, canoeing with Big Muddy Mike on the river, cycling on Katy Trail, potting trees at Forest Relief Nursery in the river bottom. 
On one trip to the nursery, they learned how much they could help monarch butterflies by planting their favorite food, milkweed. The milkweed plant is toxic to most birds, animals, and insects, but is essential to the caterpillars to become the monarch butterfly. This food source causes the members of the milkweed butterfly family to be distasteful to predators. Milkweed can be planted to attract monarchs and other members of the milkweed butterfly family. When the leaves and stems of the plant are broken, a milky substance is secreted, which gives them their name. They learn that monarchs are also called milkweed butterflies. Like some kids, butterflies are picky eaters. They only like a few foods. But for monarchs, it isn't mac and cheese and french fries. It's milkweed. The kids found a perfect sunny spot at the edge of their backyard and planted a small butterfly garden with six milkweed plants. In just a few weeks, they found a monarch caterpillar as big as one of the leaves happily snacking on the milkweed leaf. But the best trips of all were to Grandpa's farm near Tree Lure. They looked for arrowheads and more mushrooms. They walked in the creek and they learned about a special patch of gravel where the kill deer nested. They identified their favorite birds and trees like bluebirds and goldfinches and burr oaks and dogwoods. They went on a honeysuckle hike one day along the Katy Trail and learned about bad plants like bush honeysuckle that strangle the good trees and wildflowers. The bush honeysuckle plant is as harmful for the environment as the milkweed is good. Bush honeysuckle produces red berries as shown in the photo and they are appealing in appearance but provide minimal nutrition for the birds and animals that feed on them. More important, these plants crowd out desirable native plant species, ruin forested landscapes and open fields and roadsides and create areas where ticks can flourish. Ooh. And on one hike, far out on the trail near Marthasville, they found a special tree, a huge burr oak on the hill overlooking the river. Its branches were as big as trunks of most trees. And if all of the children had linked arms, they couldn't have reached all the way around it. Grandpa told them it was probably more than 200 years old. These acorns are enormous. I've never seen acorns this big. Grandpa, can we take some, please? He nodded. And they each took a burr acorn home to care for and to plant the following spring. So this chapter reminded me a lot of road trips. And so I got to thinking about trips that I would take with my own family. And this one poem that I wrote talks about that journey and how fun it was when it was my mama, the road, and I. So I'm going to share that with you guys today. Hopefully you enjoy it. Heading to North Carolina. Limbs hanging out of windows, toes curling on the dash, slobber hitting the velvet seats. It was my mama, the road, and I. Stopping at suspect diners, eating till belly swole, swerving, twisting, singing, spotting a cardinal bird. It was my mama, the road, and I. Picking up a stranger, making all new types of friends. We just two little ladies heading down south again. It was my mama, the road, and I. Inhaling the sycamores, picking sunflowers, spitting seeds, spying, laughing, dancing, cows chewing what they need. It was my mama, the road, and I. Problems left in cornfields, worries dropped like litter in the road, we don't pollute our attitudes, no matter how bad a day goes. For each bad, there's always good. The sun will shine on summer, traveling on and on. Just my mama, the road, and I.
I love that poem. And I love that this chapter really reminded me of those memories of traveling with family and being able to see a lot of fun things. So thank you for including me in this. I love this book, Growing Up With The River. It's a big, crucial part of kids everywhere. And I think it still resonates today. Thank you so much, Sahara, for the dynamic narration and for sharing your poem and special connection uh, to chapter nine. Uh, you have me over here daydreaming about road tripping. And uh, someone on Facebook commented, my mom of the road and I resonates with memories of many of us. So thank you so much for sharing that with uh, our audience. Our special, our first special guest for today, Bill Spradley, arborist, educator, and owner of Trees, Forest, and Landscapes, Inc., is unable to join us in person, but he did send over a video. Uh, Bill graduated from the University of Missouri Columbia with a bachelor's degree in forest management. Bill has been a horticulturalist instructor at St. Louis Community College at Merrimack since 1992 and is a member and past officer of several professional organizations, including St. Louis Arborist Association, Gateway Professional Horticulturalist Association, and Missouri Botanical Garden. Bill has been awarded the Distinguished True Professor Professionals of Arbor Cultural Award for Outstanding Involvement in Community Service and Public Education by the International Society of Arbor Culture. And he has received a proclamation for outstanding community service from the state representative, Michael Gibbons, for donating agricultural care and materials to preserve Missouri's largest fir oak, the McBain fir oak. And today he will talk about his special relationship to this legendary fir oak tree mentioned in the book and his ongoing efforts to care and preserve for Missouri's largest fir oak. Welcome to the magical McBain fir oak. I first laid eyes on this grand tree back in 1980 when I was a Mizzou forestry student. I was told about this grand big tree down in the the uh, river bottoms of the Missouri River. And so I made my way there, even came back with my date that I ended up marrying 36 years ago. So this was an important tree to me like it has been to a lot of other people. But this this fir oak uh, is so grand for its size, 93 inches in diameter. So it's a co-national champion with another one that's 101 inches. Uh, but that one's failing and falling apart. So we think this is now the full national champ. And um, it's a, a little over 150 foot crown spread and a little taller than 80 feet tall, like close to 84 feet. So pretty majestic. It's our largest uh, oak in, in Missouri. And like I said, for the bur oak, it's the national champion. The range of the, the bur oak's amazing. It goes all the way from Missouri, southeast quite a bit, uh, further east. Uh, up into Iowa, Minnesota, and I found some some rebel stands of it up by Devil's Tower up in Wyoming. So it has the widest range of all the oaks that we know of in the United States. And so it's uh, adapting to a lot of environments. The acorn is, is the largest acorn of all the oaks in our region and the United States. The mossy cup the acorn is, is massive. But if you go up to Minnesota where the growing season is short, it's tiny little acorn about the size of our fin oak. Um, so it, it's an amazing adapting tree, like I said. Uh, this, this tree is owned by a, a five to six generation family farmers. Uh, John Sam Williamson lives right up the bluff here. And uh, in 2006, my son was coming out to Mizzou for ag journalism uh, and he, uh, was minoring in forestry. So I told him, you need to ride your bike out to the tree. So the Katy Trail comes just a couple hundred yards away. And uh, so he worked his way through the network of trails from Columbia over here. Took some photos as a great photographer that he is. The tree looked fantastic. I was happy to see that after all these years, it still looked wonderful. Uh, two years later, uh, he rode out, took some photos. The tree didn't look so good. So it was time to step into the conservation mode. And so I uh, asked a, a professor here at the university that I knew lived close to uh, John Sam Williamson to see if we'd have permission to care for the tree 
and he thought we were crazy, of course, coming from Kirkwood and for free going to work on this giant tree that has never been touched. It's estimated to be between 350 to 400 years old, and it was left to tend for itself. Maybe only a couple lower branches pruned to clear for a tractor was all that's ever been done. It's made it through the floods of 93 and a lot of other floods and the more recent one. It's made it look a little rough, so she needs a little help. And so uh, we came out in 2008, did the first round of extensive day long, got back at 11 o'clock at night. We had a fun time working on the tree and uh, we improved it. It looked good for two or three years. Then some more stresses came in and came back with a bunch of volunteers in 2013 and even installed lightning protection to try to keep this majestic tree out in the open field from being killed from a lightning strike. It's been hit a couple of times, but uh, uh, at this stage, we really need to try to protect it. But it's so close to the Katy Trail and Columbia that a number of people have ridden motorcycles out here, bicycles, uh, and they'll go whizzing by on the Katy Trail, catch out of the corner of their eye, says, wow, look at that. And they'll swing over here and have some fun. But uh, uh, moving forward, we took cuttings from the tree a number of years ago and a number of young trees uh, were grafted with those cuttings onto the rootstock of another bur oak uh, and planted out into the landscape in Columbia. Um, now we got some new cuttings uh, that are gonna be going out and trees will be planted along the Katy Trail so we can perpetuate the superior genetics of the tree. But we encourage you to come out, have lots of fun out here. Uh, check out this tree right off the Katy Trail. So good luck and hopefully we see you out here someday. Thank you so much, Bill. Uh, I routinely go out to see the uh, tree when I'm out along the Katy Trail. It is pretty amazing to think that the McBain Burr Oak has survived droughts, floods, and has witnessed all the history described in this book and more. Uh, I know it's always a delight for me to go out there. And thank you to your son for providing with providing us with so many amazing images. Our second guest for this afternoon is Ken Boltholtz, Buckholtz, director of the Audubon Center at Riverlands. Ken lives in St. Louis with his wife, two children, and four pets. He loves being outdoors, especially enjoys going birding, paddling, and hiking. Uh, and today he will tell the story of the Audubon Center at Riverlands and its migratory bird sanctuary. Um, hi, everyone, and, and welcome. As um, uh, Lisa said, my name is Ken Buckles. I'm the director of the Audubon Center at Riverlands. And I'm glad to be with you today to help tell the story of growing up with the river and specifically the story of our center and the American white pelican featured in chapter nine. Um, so who here has been to the Audubon Center at Riverlands? If you've ever visited Jones Confluence State Park where the Mississippi and Missouri rivers meet, you pass through Riverlands and right by our center. So be sure to stop by during your next visit. We are located on the Mississippi River, just a few miles from its confluence with the Missouri River. You can clearly see the beautiful Clark Bridge and downtown Alton skyline from our center. We were opened in 2011 and we are one of 41 Audubon centers in the US. Audubon centers are regional hubs of influence and leadership for conservation. Our mission is to connect people to the beauty and awe of the Great Rivers Confluence area and to inspire conservation of this vital natural resource for the benefit of birds, wildlife, and people. Our center is also the project of the National Audubon Society and a unique partnership with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. We are located on 3,700 acres of the Riverlands Migratory Bird Sanctuary, which are public lands managed by the Corps. So together, the center and sanctuary provide a powerful platform for conserving birds, our great river's habitat, through hands-on learning in nature, science and conservation, public engagement, and nature-based recreation. 
So since we are public lands, we have eight miles of trails for you uh, to enjoy. And this also includes a 1,200 acre prairie marsh, uh, a river island, and scenic overlooks, and a one of a kind avian observatory and several picnic areas. There are also multiple points of access to the river, Mississippi River, and abundant opportunities to view birds and other wildlife and simply enjoy the outdoors. Um, you might have heard um, that Riverlands is a premier Midwest bird watching or birding destination. Do you know why there are so many birds here? It has to do with our location near two highways for birds or migratory flyways. Every spring and fall, millions of birds migrate to move from areas of low or decreasing resources to areas of high or increasing resources. Hundreds of bird species use the Mississippi and Missouri rivers as their migratory flyway in search of food, shelter, and safe passage. The Mississippi River alone supports 60% of North American birds and 40% of U.S. waterfowl. 300 of these species have been recorded at Riverlands. A perennial favorite at Riverlands is the American White Pelican. Visitors are often surprised to see pelicans here because they think of them as coastal birds. The American White Pelican is one of the largest birds in North America with a nine foot wingspan. It is similar to the more coastal brown pelican in shape, but much larger and has different habits. It occurs far inland. It feeds cooperatively in shallow, shallow lakes, and it does not dive from the air for fish. And despite its great size, it is a spectacular flyer with flocks often soaring very high in the air, ponderously wheeling and circling in unison. It forages by swimming on the surface, dipping its bill into the water and scooping up fish in its pouch. During breeding season, it does much foraging at night, locating fish by touch during frequent dipping of its bill. By day, it probably locates prey visibly, visually. It may also forage cooperatively, lining up and driving fish toward large, shallow bodies of water. Spring and fall are ideal times to see pelicans on the Missouri River and here at Riverlands. Fall and winter often offer amazing opportunities to see two other favorite birds at Riverlands and on the nearby Missouri River, the bald eagle and the trumpeter swan. Thanks to past and continued conservation efforts, we readily see bald eagles in the wild today. While there are resident eagles and great, in the Great Rivers confluence year round, Winter is the best time for viewing eagles here as they move from frozen waters in the northern states above us to open waters further south in search of food. Like eagles, trumpeter swans also face extinction as recently as the 1970s. Restoration in the 1980s fueled the trumpeter swans comeback. Natural resource managers began raising trumpeter swans using eggs from Alaskan swans. They released the young birds in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and other Midwestern states. Their populations started to reestablish. The first trumpeter swans made, it, made their way back to Riverlands in 1991. The next year, a few more arrived. Today, Riverlands is home to one of the largest migratory overwintering populations of trumpeter swans in the interior U.S. Now that's a qualifier for sure. Um, community scientists recently counted up to 2,000 trumpeter swans during our annual Great Rivers Trumpeter Swan Watch. November through January are the best times to see trumpeter swans and eagles at Riverlands and the Missouri River and, and the Great Rivers Confluence area. 
fall is here, and I encourage you to get outdoors uh, to enjoy all that the Missouri River and the Great Rivers Confluence has to offer. Plus, being outdoors restores the spirit and improves physical and mental well-being. So get out in nature, uh, take in all that we have here uh, at Riverlands and along the Missouri River. And I appreciate you for giving me the time to tell you um, our story and share um, our um, amazing uh, Missouri River and Mississippi Rivers with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Um, I hope that everyone can make a trip out to the Riverlands. Uh, they do have an event coming up called Pelican Day Trek or Treat. And I do believe that you get to dress up as your favorite migratory animal. Um, I'm thinking about maybe going. Uh, it sounds like a super fun time. Uh, we went ahead and connected the event link into the Facebook comments. Um, Thanks to everyone who has registered in advance for this series. With each chapter, we're hosting a little giveaway to folks who registered. And today, the winner will receive a t-shirt graciously donated by the Auto Ben Center. So thank you again, Ken, for all of your support with this program today. So if you're registered for the series, keep an eye out uh, for an email. You could be our winner. If you would like to receive series updates, including links to videos, fun book activities, and raffle prizes, visit mohumanities.org. Uh, thanks to everyone who tuned in for Chapter 9 of Growing Up with the River, and special thanks to HECTV for helping us present this program, to Sahara Sister of Souls, our featured storyteller and guest speakers, Bill and Ken. Uh, Growing Up with the River uh, describes many different kinds of birds found in Missouri. For this, so for this chapter's activity, uh, you will build a simple toilet paper roll bird feeder to attract birds to your own backyard. There's even a space to draw a picture uh, of one of your favorite bird visitors. Uh, we'll include this activity in the comments below. Uh, we hope to see you all back next week for chapter 10, our final uh, chapter. So uh, thanks everyone for joining us and uh, have a great evening. Thanks. <laughs>